Today, we're going to examine the claims behind modern portfolio theory and see if they have any validity whatsoever. Modern portfolio theory is a fancy concept developed in the 50s by Harry Markowitz. Modern portfolio theory came in and revolutionized how investors think about portfolio construction. Remember, at that point in time, we didn't know much about how to grow wealth in an evidence-based manner. And the claims and processes established by modern portfolio theory are still widely applied today. But instead of going over every little mathematical detail, let's just make this super intuitive. Let's bring out the graphing paper and plot out an X and Y axis. On the Y axis, we're going to have return. And on the X axis, we're going to measure risk using a simple intuitive reading, volatility. I mean, at the very least, we could all agree volatility can be pretty uncomfortable, at least on the downside. Now that you see this chart, just ask yourself, where would you like your portfolio to be? Obviously, we would all attempt to avoid the bottom right, a portfolio that's all volatility and no return. And if your portfolio looks like this, we need to talk. Stands to reason then that we would all want to be on the opposite side of that bet, aim to have a portfolio that's all return and no risk, or in this case, volatility. And that would be the top left. In fact, if there's a portfolio that has similar return but higher volatility, we would say that's an inefficient use of our resources, as there's already a portfolio that dominates that portfolio because it has the same return but with lower volatility. So in theory, our job as investors is to push to look for portfolios on the top left for any given period as much as possible. Okay, yeah, Jose, no crap. Obviously, if I could take all the return in the world with no risk, I would have already done that. So let's just state the obvious question. How do you perform portfolios with less risk and more return? The answer is actually something that you're probably familiar with, and that is diversification. So here's a quick example. Let's say you have two assets, and that's all you can invest in. We're gonna have asset A that has an expected return of 7% and an expected volatility of 15%. And then you have asset B, which has an expected return of 4% with a volatility of 6%. Let's also say that these two assets share a correlation of negative 25%. So these assets are negatively correlated, meaning when one is zigging, the other one is zagging. At ideal weights, combining these two assets would have an expected return of 4.7%, with a volatility of 5.1%, giving us the most optimal portfolio we can achieve with these two assets since it gets the most return that we'll get for a certain level of risk. In other words, there's no better ratio of risk to return. And all in all, given these two assets, this is as far as you can get to the top left corner. And I know what you're thinking, 4.7%, I can achieve those returns in my sleep. I just invest in asset A and get a 7% return. Forget about asset B. But remember, if instead of investing in asset A, you took this optimal portfolio, then borrowed money at the risk-free rate, and then levered it so that you can target a 7% return, you would achieve a portfolio that it displays a volatility of only 7.5% instead of asset A, which would have you eat 15% volatility. So the same, goes for reducing risk. If you wanted a portfolio that displays less volatility, you would not add more of asset B and less of asset A. You would just combine the risk-free rate with this optimal portfolio. In nerd speak, this line that displays the combination of the risk-free rate and the optimal portfolio is called the capital market line, which while we would call the portfolio combination, the tangency portfolio. In it by itself, modern portfolio theory surely does look like the perfect tool to form portfolios. I mean, all you have to do is gather investable assets in your universe, type in the expected return, volatilities, and correlations, and voila, the machine will spit out some nice weights, perfect weights you can use in your portfolio and get rich while you sleep. The main issue is that the system is extremely sensitive to the information you feed it. And there's no two ways about it the information you feed it will be off, unless you get super lucky and have perfect foresight. Some weeks ago, I had options expert Joe DiCipio from Aaron Risk Advisors over on our channel, and we talked about how he views portfolio construction. And though he was open to many ideas on this subject, this is the one thing he made sure to warn investors about regarding 
modern portfolio theory. One of the key drivers of that determination is either the variance or the standard deviation of the expected returns in those portfolios. What that means in fancy terms is somebody knows what the distribution of those returns is going to be in the future, and nobody does. Further, we don't think uh, that the future returns are going to be normally distributed. And if they're not normally distributed, then you need a higher order function than standard deviation or variance in order to help explain or capture the risk that your client or your portfolio is taking. All in all, modern portfolio theory is great in theory, and it teaches us a ton about the nature of portfolio construction. But honestly, when it comes to actually building a portfolio, we can throw this concept out the window. What the f There's just too much randomness in real life and predicting how things will look in the future can prove to be a futile exercise. In short, if you feed an optimizer garbage, it will spit out garbage. And not to mention that levering a portfolio is not as easy as it looks in theory and comes with tons of hidden risks. My sense is that investors that want a better theoretical portfolio would not love it if they got a margin call because their precious model failed to account for all the randomness in the world. So what's left? Is there anything that we can walk away with? Well, yeah, it turns out that if you can learn one thing about this whole exercise is that correlation matters. Mixing and matching assets that are imperfectly or even negatively correlated can make for more robust portfolios. Perhaps we shouldn't try to forecast what correlations will look like in the future to the dot. But if there is an economic reason to believe that some assets and strategies are natural diversifiers to one another, then I think it would be worthwhile to consider mixing and matching those. In short, if modern portfolio theory has anything to tell us is that combining imperfectly correlated assets can be hugely beneficial to investors' portfolios, as they can reduce volatility while preserving, maybe even adding, expected return. So let's take it to the next step and see how we can potentially improve our stock selection so that we can form better portfolios. In our next video, we'll go over what types of strategies could help in achieving robust portfolios, specifically in the equity market. Here at Alpha Architect, our goal is to empower investors through education. We're an asset management firm that focuses on delivering affordable alpha to our clients. If you want more educational content like this, head to alphaarchitect.com. I'll see you there.